Okay, everybody, we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Dakota Moore. I'm here with the Kentucky Horticulture Council, and we thank you for coming to this uh, webinar we've got today uh, from Janet Meyer. She's with Berea College. She's worked on their farm uh, for several years and uh, has experience with the beneficial insects uh, on their farm, and she's going to tell us all about it. Um, we will be posting this um, uh, webinar to YouTube afterwards, and we'll email you the link so you can go back and uh, watch. Um, so I will go ahead and turn it on over to Janet. Hey, everybody. Um, yeah, I, I will just share my personal experience on the college farm. I have been there for 14 years now. So we'll start talking about beneficial insects. Ooh, let me go here see here. Um, just as a general overview, the things that I think of as beneficial insects include pollinators like bees, moth, moths, ants, butterflies. There's predators uh, that just eat pests uh, like our ladybugs, mantid, spiders, ground beetles, surfeit fly, larva, lacewing. It's actually the larva on those. And then we have in the insect world, we talk about uh, parasitoids that actually kill the host um, instead of uh, just feeding on it. So if you think about uh, an animal having intestinal worms, it doesn't typically kill the animal, although it drains them and maybe reduces their vigor, but the parasitoids in the insect world, they actually kill an insect. And we'll go to the pollinators now, which most people are very, very accustomed to the different kinds of bees we might have. And you probably see them, things like honeybees and bumblebees and carpenter bees. Carpenter bees can be viewed as a pest because they do damage wood. And then there are a lot of other classes of bees. I think that's a list of 15 different kinds of common bees in the state of Kentucky. And I have, you, you and I have probably both encountered all these different kinds of bees and maybe we don't know them by their, their names, um, except the honeybees and the bumblebees and carpenter bees, but there are other bees that are important in our environment. And uh, uh, so if you are observing your natural systems, you're gonna see a lot of these different types of bees. And butterflies, uh, I, and in the process of doing this presentation, looking at it, uh, we just think of butterflies as being nice and pretty and they have, caterpillars that will eat our plants, but the butterflies often have very specific relationships with a specific plant that allows them to be the only pollinator or the primary pollinator of something like a milkweed. Uh, so they are very specific relationships. And you think about flies as pollinators. When you have somewhat stinky flowers, you'll see a lot of flies around those flowers, helping to pollinate those flowers. And ants are, are always roaming around all over the place and they're gonna be spreading pollen. Some of them would deliberately collect pollen or nectar and help in that pollination process. And wasps will also serve as pollinators because they enjoy nectar as well. Um, some of the, these are pictures of bees that I found in, in my environment um, and, and they need some flowers. These are just garden flowers that serve as a good source of pollen for the bees. And you see the honeybees on our dandelion flowers. Um, and there's a bumblebee of some sort, a nice big, bombus type bee on a dahlia flower and this other bee which I if I'm not an entomologist I'm just uh, a farmer really and so I could be mistaken that that does look like a bee to me and I couldn't tell you what 
a kind. And if uh, I want to say, and I don't know, Dakota, if this is okay, if someone has questions that they want to ask while we're going, I, I would be willing to stop and answer questions because I think we have time during the pollen it, it, during the presentation to answer questions. I'd much rather be on the farm and interact with everyone in that environment. So we'll just open this for questions as we go along if we can. Um, and you probably know that pollination, insect-based pollination is essential for certain crops. And as I look this up, and as a general rule, maybe it isn't absolutely essential for things like strawberries and blueberries. Maybe they're going to get pollinated, but some of the statistics I saw said that you'll lose 50 to 55% of your yield if you don't have pollinators in your environment. So for example, we have multiple different varieties of blueberries, and then we have honeybees on the farm. So the honeybees feed heavily on the blueberry flowers when the blueberries are blooming, and they're creating that situation where we have cross-pollination, which creates very vigorous organic blueberries. And then our, our strawberries are in high tunnels that have roll-up sides, and our honeybee hives are nearby, so the honeybees will go in and um, collect pollen from those uh, strawberry flowers, and we get much better shaped fruit and good fruit sets on our strawberries because we have those bees there. When we had high tunnels that had closed sides, I would actually buy They live for a certain period of time and they do sting. Of course, honeybees will sting too, but um, it's much better for the plants to have the roll-up sides and it allows for better pollination. It's just a healthier environment for the plants with those roll-up sides. Uh, squash has male and female flowers, so if you want to get a good population or a good, a good yield of squash, you ab absolutely need to have pollinators. Um, at one point we were growing an acre or an acre and a half of squash and the number of different kinds of bees in the squash was pretty amazing. Um, bumblebees, probably the squash bees, also our honeybees would be seen out in the squash and the field would be all abuzz in the morning. So we do uh, grow, some years we grow cherry tomatoes in our high tunnels. And while a tomato can be pollinated by wind when it's outdoors, it's not particularly windy in a high tunnel. So bees are very important. And, and with roll-up sides on a high tunnel, we will see the honeybees come into the high tunnel. And these are sun gold tomatoes, one of our most popular varieties of tomatoes. And the honeybees will come in the high tunnel as long as it has the roll up sides and they'll fly right back out. But if we didn't have roll up sides on the high tunnel, I would wanna buy a box of bumblebees to pollinate these. The other option would be using some sort of vibrating tool. Um, and uh, help release the pollen for good pollination. We'll move on to the some butterflies, another pollinator that I mentioned earlier. And one of the things, uh, the Berea College Farm has been certified organic for over 20 years now. I think it's closer to 25. And we just have a, an amazing abundant population of butterflies and other beneficial insects there. And these are some pictures that I've taken around the farm. When I see uh, butterflies present, I, I like to take their photos. So the, the campus actually also does not spray 
pesticides or herbicides and the lawns have uh, a lot of different species of weeds which which are beneficial to our insect population and there are deliberately planted monarch and butterfly gardens on campus so it it helps keep the population of these beneficial insects up in general And now I'll move on to some of the predators we see. This is a wolf spider that's covered with babies. Um, and I thought that was a spectacular photograph uh, to show. And it, it, I, don't, I don't know if anyone out there roams around in the dark with a headlamp on, but if you do, you'll see little sparkly points all over the place. And I would say on the Berea College Farm, where we have been certified organic for many years, there's a spider every uh, square inch. No, I'm exaggerating a little bit. It's probably not quite that much, but there are there's an abundant um, spider life in our field. So in the high tunnels, it's it's probably maybe one spider every six square inches or something like that. But there are a lot of spiders, different species of spiders. Uh, the greenhouses are particularly attractive to the large yellow garden spiders. So it's full of spiders and the fields are full of spiders. And they're, the disadvantage of that is uh, sometimes you accidentally have spiders in your produce like uh, greens, which we do wash um, before we sell them, but um, we have to remember if it won't kill the bugs, it won't kill you either. Um, then we, we have an abundant uh, population of the praying mantis um, in our, our gardens and Lots of wasps, and I know wasps and yellow jackets are can be aggressive and problematic, but as much as possible, I try to leave the populations of wasps and yellow jackets uh, alone. Now, if they are in the pathway where we will get stung by them, we will take some kind of measures to con control them, but they're actually extremely important environmental control if you're outdoors and you have um, a garden, you'll sometimes see a fairly small wasp carrying a, a cabbage worm, for instance. Um, the, the cabbage worm can be just about the same size as the wasp, or they, so they're very good predators for um, caterpillars I've found and I see it fairly frequently that there are wasps carrying away caterpillars and I have noticed in high tunnels that we have much higher populations of caterpillars than outdoors and I want to say the wasps don't seem to go in the high tunnels uh, but they do um, do some control of caterpillars outdoors and one of the most common uh, predators is ladybugs, but it's really the ladybug larvae that do more of the predatory work. Um, ground beetles, the beetles that have nice pinchers on front and, and doing preparing for this presentation. I found some other beetles that I don't know much about uh, that also are predators that take care of some of our insect problems. Um, the ground beetles I don't have any real data on it, but I know that we do have quite a few ground beetles on the Berea College farm <laughs> and that they are generally extremely beneficial. Another thing that you will see is hoverflies, <coughs> and you'll often see them kind of hovering around a flower, and it's the larva of these hoverflies that helps um, control aphids specifically. In our case, we find a lot of uh, uh, surfeit fly larvae or hoverfly larvae in the um, lettuce and other greens, and they get washed out in the washing process. Assassin bugs or wheel bugs, as some people call them, Pirate bugs um, and stink bugs. There are some predatory stink bugs out there. 
um, dragonflies, lace, lace wings, and then six spotted beetle and goldenrod soldier beetles. I really didn't know that those were predators. And in the process of doing this, I found that. And I, I found some of this information on a University of Maryland website. I just wanted to give that a shout out here. So when I mentioned that it's the eighth, it's the ladybug larva, and this is a recent picture, somebody was like, what kind of bugs are on that plant? And I said, well, we do have some aphids and we tend to have aphids in our greenhouse. We have a greenhouse and we sell plants to the general public. We grow our own plants for our fields too. So in the greenhouse, we have, um, I point out to a customer that we have ladybug larvae. So we, we want to avoid spraying because we have beneficial insects. So unless the population of aphids is extremely out of control, we're going to try to let those beneficial insects do their job. And you can see in the photograph that the uh, little uh, ladybug larva, how small it is. And there in the distance, there's a little bit further above that, there's a gnat. So you can see the little black gnat on one leaf. So when these ladybug larvae first hatch, they're tiny and you could easily mistake them for just a common gnat. Uh, and then as they grow bigger, they're more apparent, they start to have little stripes on them. Very rarely do I find people, we work with young students um, and almost no one recognizes the ladybug larva. And I get to teach people about that. And I will say one of the best refuges, the highest populations of ladybugs seem to be in areas that have the uh, winter rye planted. So there's a nice relationship when we've grown strawberries in the field, we've planted winter rye between the rows of strawberries and our populations of ladybugs are extremely high in those areas and that keeps the populations of the aphids down, which helps keep our strawberry plants healthy. Uh, so there's the gross little surfid fly maggot. I, the nice word is larva, but um, these are, are very small and they look fairly disgusting. And when we wash the lettuce, we do find them in the bottom of our bubbler tanks that we use to wash. And so when people find this, or if one accident accidentally gets left in the produce that we sell, people are a little bit disturbed by them. So there's a lot of education to let people know that these are okay. The first time I saw them, I had no idea what they were, but I looked at them under a dissecting uh, microscope and I could see that the uh, larva was just gobbling up the aphids on the sample I was looking at. And that's how I learned about surfid, surfid fly maggots or larva and how, how they're actually beneficial to us. And it wouldn't harm us at all if we did accidentally eat one. Um, this is the, the lace wing. Uh, I think people probably rec tend to recognize an adult lace wing. But once again, the larva, which looks a little bit like a tiny alligator, is what feeds on the aphids. And, and it it looks like a hair. So there's a little egg um, on the end of a stiff hair, basically, that's, uh, and that is the lacewing egg. So we wouldn't want to remove that egg because we want it to grow up and become this little um, aphid-eating alligator-looking creature. And then we do have quite a few uh, praying mantis in our environment. This one, this egg case happened to be on my porch where I left the vegetation from some vining crops uh, over the winter. And that is one advantage of leaving behind some undisturbed vegetation over the winter is it leaves a, a refuge, a place for um, 
the mantis egg case to form and multiple babies will come out of that egg case. So if I were to clip that off, I could take it to work and I could leave it in a place where we have pests and the little praying mantis would emerge and roam around and eat things. I've seen the praying mantis capture uh, large grasshoppers and I think they can, I don't know that any of them that we have here can catch a hummingbird, but I have heard of that happening. Janet, uh, we've got a question. Okay. Uh, Mackenzie asks, how long does it take for the populations to balance each other out and you not have big losses? So sometimes they don't. Um, <laughs> so that, that is one thing. Um, I would say if, if our plants are healthy and their nutrition is ba balanced and the plant is a nice vibrant green, but not overly green, we tend to have less problems with pests. Um, for the aphids in particular, they can really take off and cause a lot of problems. Um, one thing that we will do is we'll uh, maintain a, a population of uh, aphids on certain crops. So milkweed, for instance, gets the milkweed, and I think I may have a slide later about this, gets a, a special aphid on it that's a, a milk, primarily feeds on milkweed. So if we have milkweed carried over in the greenhouse, we will maintain a population of these oleander or milkweed aphids in the greenhouse, and that maintains a population of the tiny wasps that feed on the aphids. So those wasps go out and they eat aphids on other plants, or the ladybug larva eat uh, some of the aphids. Um, so my primary method is if a plant is horribly infected, um, and it's only a few plants that are horribly infected and they have a more generalized type of aphid, like a green peach aphid, um, I will remove those very badly infested plants, just completely remove them. Um, so, and then I will spray, if I really need to spray with some of our certified organic pesticide choices. So there's no magic balance, but, um, you know, some people would actually use the yellow sticky cards and check and see what the population of beneficials versus um, damaging insects are, and they would make a, a, a choice, an IPM integrated pest management choice on when it would be either economically good to spray or that the population seems imbalanced and they would spray. And I typically use a more general way of doing it. Um, and I, I would say I just observe pretty much every day and will make a decision whether or not spraying would be better than allowing the natural systems to do their job. So I can't exactly answer how long it takes to balance out. I would say if you've come from a chemical situation to all organic, I would imagine that it would take a number of years before you would see um, a good balanced population of both beneficial and uh, pest insects. I hope that answers your question. Um, so once, I, I think I mentioned this a little bit earlier that, that, that the parasites typically live in or on a host and the host stays alive, but the parasitoids do kill the host. And this is an example is our, and one of the most common examples that I think a lot of people see is a tobacco or a tomato hornworm. And it'll have all these little white fuzzy things on it. And those are uh, little cocoons of a, of a braconid wasp. And they, the, the, um, 
tomato hornworm pictured here is not going to die immediately when it's infested with those. It continues to eat for a period of time and then it eventually dies. But whenever I see a uh, tomato hornworm that is infected with these or infested with these, I leave it there because I want it to, I want the uh, beneficial insects to reproduce and spread out and help uh, control the population of pests in the area. Um, here I, I will talk about our, our aphid um, issue and the aphids you see in the slide on the left are mummified and you can see little circular holes in their body, bodies and that's where the new wasp emerges. So a tiny wasp, and you can imagine how tiny, will lay an egg in the aphid, like deposit the egg, I believe, inside the aphid, and then the larva grows up inside the aphid, and it, the aphid dies and becomes a crusty little case, and then the uh, new wasp cuts its way out. Um, and emerges and then goes on to infect another. And I, I did hold a little magnifying glass in front of my uh, camera phone to take the picture in the middle there. And so that's actually the aphid next to a mummified aphid from our, our horticultural production system. Um, and this does talk about how we do have aphids constantly in our greenhouses um, and that sometimes people choose not to buy them because they do see the pests. There are some pests in our greenhouses at all times. There are also uh, plants in our environment which help keep these small beneficial insects alive, especially things with tiny flowers like cilantro, white clover, dill, bronze fennel and alyssum. Some people will plant the alyssum interspersed with uh, a lettuce crop or another crop of greens and that helps provide a nectary and a source of pollen for our beneficial insects. This one is uh, another interesting one that we find frequently in our fields on um, cabbage plants. You'll find the cabbage worms and this I think is uh, the, the parasitoid, I think is the Cotegia glomerata and the um, cocoons that are left from that look like little yellow fuzzy things. So I also noticed that the um, caterpillars continue to live for some period of time after they have after the caterpillar has been infested, but it, it will have these larvae inside of its body. And if you, they, they kind of get discolored and they're still eating, but they're moving around a little bit slower. And if you were to pull one of the caterpillars open, you can see the little larvae uh, that look like tiny maggots in there, but then they become these, uh, they will pupate and then they'll become more beneficial insects. And the one, uh, so the one on the left is the cabbage worm and the one on the right is the one that infects the tomato hornworm. So they're very similar, but they are species specific, I do believe. You might have to ask an entomologist though. <laughs> so one of the sort, there's a couple of sources for uh, beneficial insects. The one that I've bought, purchased, uh, beneficial insects for the college farm from Culpert, which uh, their website is a little weird to navigate, but it is possible to buy through there. I did not check how much it costs for one of these pollinator boxes, but here at the college farm, we purchased one that you could actually, uh, that had a clear top so you could see what the bees are doing inside, which was pretty interesting. And then uh, Arbicore Organics listed a lot of different kinds of beneficial insects that you can purchase.
So we do have some things that are not that successful. Um, years ago, I was trying to raise partic particular types of beans for uh, bean seed production to sell bean seeds. So I tried this uh, Mexican bean beetle parasite or parasitoid and uh, it was not successful. I don't know whether it, and it has never really taken on in our environment. We don't have a repeat population. Um, and they seem to all die after the first round of uh, reproduction. They just died out. Some of the uh, bean beetle larvae died from this infection, but in general, the populations of bean beetles rounded out, just resurged almost instantaneously, and I couldn't find any more of these parasites or parasitoids in the environment. Um, even though I found the mummified bean beetle larva, and I could see where they had emerged, and I think some of them may have died inside the bean beetle larva, um, and it could have been that it was just so hot that, that when we put them out that maybe they don't tolerate hot temperatures. I'm not sure. Um, and another thing that we didn't try, but I've looked into, is a, a, a beneficial insect called a mealybug destroyer. We have mealybugs in the greenhouse, and I just like them a great deal. They cause, they cause a lot of problems and they're hard to control. There's not really any or certified organic pesticide that I've ever used that works very well to remove them. Like spraying them with soapy water and wiping them off seems to be successful, but of course, they're still more lurking somewhere else and they resurge pretty rapidly. Um, I did look at getting those. I uh, looked at a website today and saw that there were none available and they're also pretty expensive. And they warn you that the beetles or that they, the beneficial insect just flies away if you don't have it in an enclosed place. So I'm like, hmm, I think I won't buy these because most likely, I'll have a population of the beneficial insect for a very brief period of time, and then they're going to fly away. I see lots of chats. I don't know whether I should check the chat and answer questions. Someone asked for the for the names of the uh, companies you, you mentioned, and you said Copert. Was that the one with the bee box? Yeah, it's K-O-P-P-E-R-T. And Arbico, I, I think that's, I'm like, can I go I dropped, back? I dropped the websites in the chat. Okay, uh, that's good. For anyone that, that needs yeah. to, to go directly to that. Okay, so I'm, I've run a, uh, and actually that is the end of my presentation there. Um, I think... I thought I had other, another slide and like, where did it go? Um, I would say that the general take home, I'm like, I want to go backwards here. Previous, previous. Um, here we are down here. Okay. Lessons learned. I did skip over one. Here we are. Um, I think one of the most important things that after years of organic farming, organic gardening, is that we should enjoy some wild abundance, having some weeds, having some uh, a lot of different flowers in our environment, um, allowing the natural cycles to function as they should, and to have some level of willingness to have pests in our environment. Maybe instead of fighting again. So, um, you know, I'm trying to think of, of problems we've had that are hard to deal with, that we don't necessarily have any beneficial insects that help us. And that would be like um, harlequin bugs. Um, they're very problematic. And we stop growing certain plants when 
uh, we know that the population of the harlequin bugs will be high. We just stopped growing plants that those creatures love in that season. And we grow those, those crops in the fall instead of during the summer. And then we don't have a problem with that. So that's also an option. Um, and um, when I was younger, I would just assume that most bugs are pot potentially bad. But in fact, I think most of the insects in our environment are actually not harmful. Um, we have some certain things that do cause problems for us agriculturally, like squash bugs and um, the aphids cause problems for us. Stink bugs cause problems for us. Japanese beetles, we do have problems with some of them. But some of the things that I don't recognize, I reserve judgment and I choose not to um, get rid of those things. If I don't know what they are, I'm going to assume that they are neutral in the environment. And then I can look up and see what they are before I take any kind of measure to control something. If it because chance are it might even be a beneficial insect like the ladybug larva they look weird an adult or you know an adult ladybug we pretty much rec recognize but the larva eat a lot more ladybugs than the adults and they're the weird looking things that could be mistaken as a pest um and then it's extremely important to have variety flowers in your environment or other plants that provide nectar and pollen for our beneficial insects. Um, that winter rye really seems to promote our ladybug populations and our cover crops creating that diversity um, in our system do help uh, encourage our, our beneficial insects in the environment. We do uh, uh, whenever possible. And that way we're not using some kind of generalist pesticide in the environment. Because if we're using something like Pyganic, even as organic far farmers, you can use that, but it, it does have negative impacts on your beneficial insects. For instance, um, I think if you use Pyganic and you happen to have um, uh, spider mites, it it kills a lot of your good good bugs, and so um, it actually is more likely to create create a problem with even more spider mites. You can control spider mites by simply sprinkling the leaves in a lot of cases. And there are predatory mites, by the way. If you see a tiny, tiny red dot running around, that's probably a predatory mite. Um, let's see. Um, and I have noticed it's it's not really about the insect populations or the beneficial insect populations, but we have great luck using overhead ir irrigation in our greenhouses for the greens production in the high tunnels. Um, I think that that may flush out excess nitrate nitrogen in the plants themselves, which may be increasing our plant health. But I also uh, think that it, it has uh, a negative impact on aphids in those, maybe it, because the leaves are wet for longer, maybe it washes them off. I don't know scientifically why that is helpful for us, but I do find that it is helpful to use overhead irrigation instead of drip irrigation for our greens production in the high tunnels. Um, so I think that is it. And uh, I'm open for questions. We've got a few questions that were dropped in the chat. I'll read those out. And if anybody else has any, uh, feel free to go ahead and put those in there. Uh, so first up, Chris asks, is there a, any scientific evidence for planting sacrificial crops uh, to trap certain pests? It has been my experience that if I plant eggplant, the flea beetles destroy them 
but leave the other crops alone, trying to determine if there is other proven techniques like this. I have read about those. Um, I think I've I've read that if you um, have a problem with thrips in a greenhouse, for instance, if you plant um, certain types of marigolds outside of your greenhouse, that the thrips love marigolds so much that they will move out of your greenhouse to attack the marigolds instead of the plants that are in your greenhouse. And that you could periodically just destroy the marigolds and plant a new round of marigolds and you would keep the population of thrips down. I haven't done that exactly. Um, and we don't typically have um, a large number of thrips in our greenhouses. I, there probably are some, but I, I I, and we have had problems at times, but we typically don't have a lot of problems with those. So I do think there are, and yes, we have also experienced a lot of problems with flea beetles on certain crops. So yes, flea beetles love eggplant more than anything on the face of the earth, I think. So yeah, I, I, I would not be surprised if that's helpful to keep the population of flea beetles away. And David asks, do you see any difference in pests when high tunnel plants in ground versus greenhouse and raised beds versus hydroponic systems? So we don't have any true hydroponic systems in our greenhouses, so I can't really compare to that. Um, I do think that our pest populations tend to be higher in our high tunnels. And I, I think that's probably because it's a somewhat protected environment. So the plants aren't experiencing, and the insects aren't experiencing real rain or real wind. Um, they're not experiencing real weather. So I think it protects some of those um, pests, or maybe it's something else that I, I have not identified. We do sometimes see in the greenhouses in the high tunnels and where they're planted in the ground and we are, they're planted in the ground in raised beds and we use various methods to control weeds. I have noticed that um, sometimes in certain weather conditions especially, we'll see moldy aphids and they, I, I asked, I went, I was in the Netherlands several years ago and I actually asked whether there were mold, like it could mold be used to control aphids and if they had ever tried it at the copper biological where they started the copper company. And they said, we did, but it killed all the aphids in the lab. So we stopped trying it because it killed all the lab aphids. And I'm like, well, that's interesting. So if I mixed up these, um, moldy aphids and 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 grew more mold, I could probably spray mold on the aphids and kill all the aphids. The bad problem is though, they kind of stick to the leaves after they die and they look like little exploded aphid sponges. So they're unappealing snacks, but um, I know I, I don't, they, there would, there, there could be a problem there. So I think the protected environment protects the insects is the, the short story and that we do have more pest problems of certain pests inside the high tunnels. Do you have harder time attracting the beneficials to those, um, you know, enclosed environments or protected environments? I do see the beneficials. In fact, I was looking at a little yellow sticky card when one of the professors had um, students taking samples in the high tunnels. And uh, we were examining what was on the sticky card and there were almost as many beneficial wasps, the tiny wasps that kill the aphids as there were aphids on the card. And I was like, well, the, the, the beneficials are probably attracted to the sticky card. So I think they're generally attracted to it, but it's, uh, I don't think, 
um the, the wasps will like hang out in the door of the high tunnel but they seem to just use it as a rain shelter and then they go out of the high tunnel i don't see the the wasps actually working in the high tunnel so um that's just observation no no real science behind that are there any other questions for janet before we wrap up Feel free to unmute if you just want to ask it, or you can drop it in the chat. Well, while I give people a chance to type, uh, you mentioned the, the mealybug destroyer. Um, I tried that one time years ago in a greenhouse, and. We saw them for a while, but we didn't see a second uh, population from the, the destroyers. So they did their job, but I think if you uh, if you really wanted to go after that, you might have to reintroduce mm. uh, populations. Um, yeah, I, I, read, I read that if you don't have some type of netting on your greenhouse, they all just fly away. I think the fans pulled them through. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And they're pretty expensive. Mm-hmm. Very. Well, I don't think... Oh, we've got one question. What do you suggest as a resource for insect identification? Are there any books you really like or websites you use? Um, I, in, in the process of making this presentation, I actually enjoyed that um, University of Maryland website. And I... I I think if you look for, uh, I think I used, uh, started with parasitoids and went down the rabbit hole of all different kinds of beneficial insect photographs and information about them. But there are also the, the company like the Arbico company that I mentioned, it has a good deal of information about beneficial insects there. Um, there's a, a little book that I have. Um, I think it's called Good Bug, Bad Bug, which is a good introductory book about beneficial insects. And we'll show you pictures of your basic good bugs and basic bad bugs. David asks, do, you, uh, do fans help control pests or, uh, or do they impact beneficials too much? Oh. Fans, as in um, just air circulation fans? Uh, probably. Okay. That, that's what um, I'd imagine. I, I, have, I have not really considered that before, and I haven't noticed it. I know, um, it, in my opinion, air circulation fans in the greenhouse are extremely important for plant health because they reduce leaf wetness. And they at least, uh, they, well, just circulating the air also reduces like excessive temperature in one location and, and helps with um, just general crop health. But I, I don't know that they have a big impact on the beneficial insects. I don't see any other questions, so we'll go ahead and wrap up. We thank you so much for speaking with us, Janet. 